Hello, uh, good afternoon and welcome to all of you joining us today and good morning to our speaker who is joining us from America. Um, I have a few things to read out to you first before we get started, but my name is Emily Roberts. I'm here on behalf of the Enterprise Hub and I'm very pleased to be part of this event today. So a very warm welcome to all of you joining this session, which is part of the Wales MIT Virtual Conference Series. Um, I continue in English. As many of you will know, MIT is the world's top research and academic institution, globally renowned expertise in areas such as technology, engineering, science and leadership. Very excitingly, it also boasts 93 Nobel laureates, among many other accolades, which is very exciting. Research has shown that MIT alumni have launched over 30,000 companies around the world, employing over 4 million people and generating almost 2 trillion in annual revenues. So just a little bit more than us here in Wales, but I'm sure we will catch up. As you might expect, many global businesses seek to partner with MIT, including familiar names such as Google, Shell, Intel, Samsung and Siemens. Some important information for small businesses who are joining us today. Businesses here in Wales are also able to engage directly with MIT through the Welsh Government membership of the Industrial Liaison Programme, which has made today's session possible. So thank you very much to the Welsh Government. This programme includes access to the latest online resources and research webinars and bespoke meetings with MIT faculty on specific areas of interest. The Welsh Government also provides support to businesses in attending flag flagship MIT conferences. These are being delivered online due to COVID-19, but we will hope to return to MIT in the near future. So Welsh governments, please remember me when we do host those MIT sessions. I will be on that plane to America first thing. Um, a little bit about us then. So I am Emily Spark, but I also work for the Enterprise Hub. The Enterprise Hub offers support to help you start and develop your business. We offer one-to-one -one advice with a dedicated business advisor, help for everything from your business plan to your marketing strategy, um, invitations to events such as this one, mentoring support, and we bring you as part of the community. So if you're a small business watching today and you would like some business support, please visit the enterprisehub.wales. We are a small team of six ready to offer you support and help you to develop and grow your business. So that's all the background out of the way. You'll be thrilled to hear we are nearly on to our speaker. I am delighted to introduce today's session on empowering women in STEM and advocating for diversity. Ritu, who is going to be our speaker today, is an engineer, innovator, writer, and the Durbloff Career Development Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Thank you for joining us, Ritu. Ritu runs a lab that designs adaptive living materials for applications ranging from medicine to mach machines, currently focused on engineering the neuromuscular system to restore mobility and power robots, which sounds so cool. I'm really excited to hear about that. Ritu grew up in India, Kenya and the United States and has learned to appreciate and thrive in diverse and dynamic environments. Her life experiences have shown her that technical innovation can drive positive social change, and this inspires her to help democratize and diversify STEM education and entrepreneurship around the world. As a triple A, S, if slash then ambassador, her goal is to empower young women to explore STEM careers. As we go along through the talk, please feel free to post questions using the Q&A Q and A function, and we will address as many as possible at the end of the session. You're welcome to post your questions in English or in Welsh, and we will, of course, translate them for you too. Um, so please, as interactive as possible, make the most of this fantastic opportunity to engage with Ritu and ask questions. And so on to the star of the show, over to you, Ritu, and thank you again for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's very exciting for me to take a trip even virtually to Wales, though I hope I get to be there physically someday. Um, and thanks also for offering to translate the questions because I do not speak um, Welsh. But I'm very, very excited um, to talk to this audience and not only um, answer any questions that you have, but also get your thoughts on feedback on some of these ideas. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in um, advocating for diversity. I just do the best that I can um, with the kinds of experiences and information that I have throughout my life. Um, so I'll start just by giving a quick introduction of myself. Um, 
As Emily mentioned in the introduction, I grew up across three different continents. So I was born in India, moved to Kenya when I was a baby, moved back to India, and then moved to the U.S. when I was around 10, and have moved every couple of years ever since um, in different parts of the U.S., which have very, very um, different cultures. So it kind of feels like leaving the country sometimes. Um, and, you know, the exciting thing about, you know, that kind of life, um, the, well, I'll start with the hard thing. The hard thing about that kind of life is that when you don't have stability, um, it can be really difficult to advance your education, you know, in different types of systems, speaking different languages, um, adapting to different cultures. But the nice thing is that you do get to experience all of the richness that the world has to offer, um, especially, you know, when you have that cushion at home. So for me, my outside world was full of instability. Um, but my inside world inside the home was was very, very full of stability and love and encouragement in the form of my mom, my dad, and my grandfather, all of whom are engineers. So my mom's a chemical engineer. You can see her uh, and me feeding a giraffe in the middle there. Uh, my dad's a mechanical engineer like me. Uh, so that's us exploring the Great Rift Valley in um, Kenya. Um, and then on the left is my grandfather, who is a civil engineer and who taught me a lot of the things about, you know, how to take things apart and put them back together very early in my life and felt, made me feel very empowered um, to take charge in a lot of situations. So with these kind of three engineers and role models in my life, um, I not only had a great example of all of the different types of people that could be engineers, but also examples of what being an engineer could really mean for um, a community in terms of having positive impact on our world. Um, so these are some pictures from our time in Nairobi in Kenya. So Nairobi is a big city and that's where we lived um, during the weekdays. But on the weekends, uh, my parents and I um, would travel to remote villages that weren't initially connected to the global communications infrastructure. Um, but there were teams that um, my dad was helping direct that would put up these communication towers. So it's kind of like long structures that you see in, you know, not only in the pictures, but also in our built environments. And those would essentially connect the villages um, to the cities and other parts of the world as well. And so for me at a very early age, it was a great example of seeing that engineers built solutions to problems and that could have a very positive impact on um, a community. And it was such a positive and happy message and I'm very similar to my parents. So even though I considered, you know, a lot of different paths, um, engineering was kind of something that was always in my mind as something I wanted to do. And I understand that I'm very lucky to have those kinds of examples be kind of thrown at me in this very positive and exciting way so early in life, um, which is not true for everybody. So, you know, most of the time um, through from birth to when I was about 16 or so, you know, moving around, going to a bunch of different schools. And yes, engineering was a part of my life, but I think there's a stereotype, um, at least in America, about um, Indian immigrants, you know, like being like, there's a strong focus on like science and engineering and math. And like, that's the only thing you're allowed to do. And that certainly wasn't the case for me and my family. Um, you know, I was very encouraged to pursue art and music and writing. And when it came time for me to apply to college and pick a major, um, my parents were like, pick whatever pick whatever you want. And they, and they really, really meant it. And I think they actually thought that I really wanted to be a journalist because I really enjoy writing. Um, and I would still consider myself a writer, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, but, you know, at the time, because partly because there was a space launch that was happening and I thought that was cool. So like, maybe I want to be an astronaut. And so I should be an aerospace engineer. That seems like a path to this goal. But also I was an immigrant to the U.S. and the way like work visas and stuff work. I knew that, you know, if I hopped off my, when I turned 21, I was going to hop off my parents' visa application and have to apply for a visa on my own. And I knew that, you know, having a technical degree was just going to improve my chances of, of getting that visa if I needed it. Um, so I chose to major in engineering partly because I liked it and partly because I didn't really have another choice um, based on, you know, government policies. <laughs> um, so I chose to be engineering and thankfully it's something that I have learned to really love um, and be passionate about. So, 
you know, applying one of the first hurdles that I had to cross because nobody in my family had been to college in the U.S. before was to really figure out how to apply to college in America. And I don't know how it is in Wales, um, but in India, where my parents went to college, it's very much like there's these, you know, big exams that one takes and, um, you know, based on your rankings of the exam and, and the rankings of the school, you're kind of trying to get matched to a program and a degree based on how well you did on those very high stakes um, exams. And in college um, in America is very different, right? We do have some standardized tests like the SAT um, and other things, but it's also very dependent on how you did in school and your extracurriculars and random other black box factors that nobody really understands. I'm a professor at an elite college in America now, and I have no idea how this stuff works. So through some magical thing, um, they're choosing the people who get to attend college. And so for me, especially at that time, because the internet was not as great of a resource as it is, I think now, I didn't have a ton of advice on how to apply to college or what the components were, or even how to find out what the best universities in the US were. Um, so I was at a sleepover at my friend's house and her older sister said something about how Ivy League is a good thing. And that was the only thing I knew, that Ivy League is a good thing. Um, so I just looked up whatever universities were considered Ivy League, um, and I just applied to all of those. And nobody told me that you're also supposed to apply to some schools that aren't Ivy Leagues because the odds of getting into one of those is very low. Um, but very, very luckily, I did get into one of the schools I applied to, um, Cornell, and which happened to be the best engineering school in the Ivy League also. And it just, you know, was a, was a very, very lucky break for me um, getting into that program. So I got to Cornell um, and, you know, had to deal with a lot of financial challenges associated with, again, like college in America and in other places is, is very, very expensive. And I was a relatively recent immigrant at the time and not eligible for financial aid because I was an immigrant. Um, so I ended up, you know, my family had to make a lot of different decisions and sacrifices to make sure um, that I would have enough to kind of get through um, that time in my life. And that also, even though my parents would never say that, you know, as a teenager, knowing how many sacrifices somebody is making to put you into college, um, in such a good college, it puts a lot of pressure on you um, to do well, right? So especially because I was trying to do aerospace engineering, which at that time was bundled into mechanical engineering at Cornell, and I was one of the only women in my program, it was extremely challenging to feel like not only are you a representative for, you know, if you don't do well, people are going to think maybe women aren't good at mechanical engineering. Um, so I was very afraid to mess up or go to office hours or look stupid, but also that there was this huge amount of pressure that I was putting on myself to do well because I didn't want to waste um, this money and this opportunity that I'd been given. Um, so I was under a lot of pressure, but still having a good time. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to enroll in the Intro to Aerospace Engineering class at Cornell. Um, and it got filled up before I could enroll. And the woman, the girl who was living next to me in my dorm, um, which I only stayed in for a little bit of time because I couldn't really afford to stay there um, all four years. Um, I, she told me something about how she was taking a class with somebody with a fancy British accent, um, which I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I was like, oh, that sounds like a great reason to take a class. Um, so I decided to take a class uh, with a professor who had a fancy British accent, and he happened to be teaching intro to biomedical engineering. And in addition to sounding different from everyone else, um, he was also just an incredibly engaging and dedicated educator um, who showed me for the first time that engineers could really have an impact on medical medicine. And that's not something that I had exposure to from my family or anyone I knew. Um, I, the only vision I had of doctors is what you see on TV, right? And like cutting people up and sticking them with needles. And I was like, that is not for me. I'm very squeamish. No, thank you. Um, so I just never had even considered medicine as a, as a career aspiration. And he showed me that, you know, mechanical engineers actually have a great role to play in, in designing implants and, um, a lot of prosthetics and a lot of other things. So I said, all right, forget this astronaut thing for now. Um, I am going to be a mechanical engineer who designs medical devices. Um, and I really wanted to do that and, you know, get internships and all these things in medical device companies. But again, because of my visa situation, I just wasn't eligible. So I had to 
all the internships and things that I had um, during undergrad were not really related to what I wanted to do in my career, but just the sort of people that would hire me. And when I say hire, I use the term loosely because they did not pay me. Um, so I was working several different jobs. So in 2009, the summer of 2009, I worked several different jobs at the same time. One was working for a um, project team that was working on water cleaning and purification in the Honduras. Um, one was leading bird watching tours at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the study of birds. Um, and the other was helping a biology lab that was doing um, research on rat muscle. So they wanted to see, um, you know, alcohol causes skeletal muscle degeneration and exercise makes us stronger. So what happens if you get a rat really drunk and put it on a treadmill? Um, that sounds like a joke, but it's a legitimate research project. Um, and they needed a teenager um, to do unpaid labor and put these rats on treadmills. Um, so that is what I did um, the entire summer of 2009. And initially I hated that job because as you can imagine, it's not fun to be in a basement for hours every day during the summer when you want to be having fun because you're a teenager putting rats on treadmills. Um, but as I was doing it and the more and more time I spent there, I really grew to have an appreciation for how these rats were constantly sensing and adapting to their environment in a way um, that none of the machines and robots and things that we were building with um, in my classes at Cornell at the time um, were doing. Right. So like you would build a robot and say you wanted it to now lift something heavier, you'd need to change out the motor. Right. Because you hadn't specified um, that that's something you wanted to do. Whereas where you're looking at a rat or a human being and we now are faced with a task of picking up something heavier, or climbing up more stairs every day, we can exercise and get stronger and adapt ourselves to that need. We don't need to like take out a big chunk of our body and like fit in a new part. Right. Um, so that got me really, really excited about the interface of biology and engineering and how we could learn lessons from biology and apply them to engineering problems. Um, and I figured maybe the best place to do that would be at, you know, um, some kind of smaller company where I'd get more hands-on expertise in this new interface um, or sphere of biotechnology. So I figured, you know, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go work at a biotech startup for a few years, and then I'm going to go to business school, and then I'm going to be rich. This was my plan. Um, great plan. Did, did not quite pan out that way. Um, but I did get this entrepreneurial fellowship to go work at a biotech startup, and the fellowship was actually worth a ton of money, um, but I had to turn it down because, again, I was, I was not eligible for a work visa. So I won this prestigious fellowship and I was like, thanks so much. Could I still have it, but you give me no money. How does that sound to you? And they were like, I guess that sounds fine. Um, surprisingly, they threw up a lot of paperwork hurdles. And yet um, I did end up working at this biotech startup and I had a really, really good time learning about the research at the interface of engineering and biology. But I did notice something, which is that the, C the CEO the chief scientific officer, the chief technology officer, the head of R&D, basically anyone who had a job where they were running a science team and making science decisions um, had a PhD. And I realized that if I wanted to do that, I was like, I'm C-suite material. Um, I needed a PhD. So I wanted one, but I was like, well, I can barely afford to finish undergrad. So I don't know how I'm going to go to grad school. Um, but luckily I went to an event about like grad school in America that had free pizza and I learned that um, it is in fact free. And in fact, they pay you because you're doing research and you are an employee of the university. So once I learned that, I was so excited um, to pursue this plan, applied to a bunch of grad schools, applied to like 16, 17 grad schools. I only got into one, um, but one is all you need. Um, so I got into the University of Illinois, for which I'm very grateful. Um, finished my PhD there, um, working on essentially similar to kind of the rat treadmill idea of building robots that used a living skeletal muscle to move and walk around. Um, and then I came to MIT uh, to do my postdoc with Bob Langer, who is a serial entrepreneur and, and very famous engineer at Moderna and a bunch of other biotechnology companies, um, to really learn how I could take the research I was doing in the lab and apply it to real world world problems in a translational and entrepreneurial ecosystem while still continuing to do research as an academic and a professor. Um, so after that, uh, then the pandemic happened during my job search, and I considered a whole bunch of different um, career options for myself. And it was really um, 
a challenging time in addition to, you know, just the obvious challenge that we all face of being in the pandemic, because I had to reckon with the fact that there's, you know, a range of financial decisions that you're weighing at the same time. Like, even though I am a U.S. citizen now and my family is doing much better um, than we were before, which is great and lucky for us, um, you're still reckoning with all the different kinds of things of, oh, I earned very little money throughout my 20s so that I could get to this point in my career. And so you want to choose like the best possible job that can have a positive impact. Um, but luckily, I found something that kind of Sat, checked all the boxes for me, both personally and professionally. Um, so now I'm running my own lab as a professor at MIT and studying how we can build machines using biological materials and apply that to problems um, in medicine. And my goal is to, to use the research in my lab to start companies that, that advance global health. So that's my story. Um, and I'll now talk a little bit more about why, you know, my story is certainly unique to me, but elements of it are fairly universal to people across different groups, um, not only women in STEM, but other minority groups that are underrepresented in STEM um, face similar kinds of challenges. Um, and this focus is really important because, you know, I look around MIT, for example, and that's shown in this data here as well, we're in a really great place now than even when I was doing my undergrad degree, like about 10 years ago, um, where 50% of our undergraduate population um, is composed of women. So that's great. And it looks like we've solved the problem and gender parity is here. And like, I don't even really need to be giving this talk. Um, so that's certainly the case. Um, universally as well. There's there's more women than men completing bachelor's degrees. And the number of women um, completing STEM degrees at MIT is, is high. Um, in other places, it's a little bit lower, but still 35% much more respectable than when I was in school. Um, but you what the, where you start seeing the problem is this huge drop off when people enter the workforce, um, get patents, start companies, raise venture money for their companies, and get prestigious awards like the Nobel um, for their contributions to science. And so the real problem is, you know, um, not that we're not training women, but that we are not supporting and empowering and promoting them throughout their careers to advance into these leadership roles. Um, and certainly I can say that in, in my time, I have seen very many differences in being, you know, one of few women in the room to one of the only women in the room to now, I might be in a room with a ton of women, but even at such an early stage of my career, I am usually the highest ranking woman there. Um, and that's kind of scary, right? Because it sets, puts a very high pressure environment on me professionally, but also makes me think like, you better not mess up because you are an example for all of these other people who are here as well. Um, so there's a real importance of focusing on not just recruiting women into STEM, but retaining and promoting them um, throughout that process. And there's a lot of, you know, I think when people think about bias or, or gender bias in general, these tend to think of it as this very explicit thing, like somebody coming in, pointing at me and saying like, girls are bad at math. Um, that doesn't happen that often, which is great because um, it used to, but it doesn't happen that often, but it doesn't mean that there's not still bias that's impacting women in STEM careers. A lot of bias is implicit, which means that it is um, present in our culture. It is seeped into the ways that we see the world and respond to it. And it's not unique to men. Women have just as much implicit bias against women as men do because it is a part of the culture that we've all grown up in. So it's not something that's intentionally harsh, but something that just happens as a, as a function of how we are raised. Um, so examples of this um, that were published recently um, in the journal The Lancet show that, you know, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope had a review process for people using the telescope. And before the process was made anonymous, um, very few women were funded through this proposal process. And if you asked people why, they would say, oh, it's because the science wasn't as good. You know, it wasn't because they were women, it's because the science wasn't as good. And yet after they anon anonymized review the review process, they achieved gender parity. Um, so what does this tell us? Is that either people are not ex acknowledging their explicit bias Bias, or they are reading a name and their mind and brain is filtering all these preconceived notions we have about women not being logical or good scientists, and that's impacting how they perceive the science they're reading, right? And that's really unfortunate. So there's lots of different things that we can do to think about 
how to address this kind of bias. And I want to highlight this, this example from my institution at MIT to show when that kind of addressing things can really have an impact. So that really had an impact on the Hubble Space Telescope, and that's great. But um, about 20 or 30 years ago, um, when I was born, um, there were a series of professors who were at MIT, young women professors who are still um, at MIT now, who pointed out, like literally went and measured lab spaces and counted people's salaries and did all these things and pointed out to MIT that they were discriminating against female professors, whether they meant to or not, and giving us fewer resources and expecting us to succeed at the same levels. Um, and MIT admitted that the discrimination against female professors was real and quantitative. And because of them, I now get paid the same as my male peers and get um, the same amount of lab space and lab funding. So it has a real, real impact because these are women who are still active in their careers and here now, um, but they have had a tremendous positive impact on, on my existence as a young professor at MIT. Um, so I'd like to talk about just quickly um, some of the experiences I've had advocating for girls and women in science at different stages of their careers and talking about how those approaches approaches have to evolve um, to different ages. So at the very young age, like elementary school, I'm showing on the bottom right there a video that I would highly um, recommend you look up on YouTube. Um, it's by it's called She Can STEM, Riley Meets Virtu. That's me and that's Riley. Um, and shows a young girl and me talking about, you know, her experiences in science, why she's excited about it, and doing a 3D printing demo. It's like one of the most heartwarming things I've seen, and I'm in it. Um, so <laughs> that's like an unusual experience. And I'm also part of this If Then Ambassadors program in America, where they have 100 women in science, different science disciplines, different stages of their careers, and they take a bunch of videos and pictures of us talking about science and talking about our paths to science and doing a bunch of things. Um, that serve as a free digital resource for classrooms and other things to get middle school girls excited about science. And the nice thing about this is that somebody might look at me and be like, yeah, I really relate to this girl. Um, and so I'm really understanding and relating to the things she's saying. But there are a lot of girls who are going to look at me and just not have that much in common with me because we are individuals. Um, and that's why we have 100 other women um, who are very different from me. And maybe one of them could serve as an ambassador and role model um, for these girls as well. So that works really well at the elementary and middle school level, it's really just about getting people excited and letting them know that this is a possibility for them and they can reach out and, and do it and see it as a possibility. Um, and the exciting thing about the kinds of outreach that I've been doing um, is realizing that, you know, you have to reach girls in new ways. Not everything is digital as much as we like to think it is. Um, not everything is going to reach um, folks in the same way or get them excited in the same way. So I'm also part of a lot of different, more unique types of exhibits, um, getting girls excited about science. Um, so for example, I serve as a science advisor for the Curie Society, which is a comic book series published by MIT Press. I highly recommend it. It's really fun. It's about a team of girls um, that are undercover spies um, who use science to um, solve the world's problems. So it's kind of like superhero comic books, but more scientifically rooted um, and using real people and real heroes. Um, we also have a statue exhibition going on right now at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, where I was just visiting about a week and a half ago. Um, so we have a statues of the 100 If Then Ambassadors, real life, life-size 3D printed statues um, distributed throughout the um, National Mall area in the US. And so people who are coming to DC also get to see, you know, in all the museums, all we're highlighting are a bunch of men. Um, and now we are adding the largest collection of statues of women ever assembled. And so young girls and young boys who are walking through um, DC and all the museums can also see that inspiration can look very different and come from people who look very different. So I'm very excited to be parts of these kinds of endeavors. We have a lot of other fun kinds of things I work on as well. Like we do STEM trading cards um, that you know go into different classrooms. And we're also present in different types of smaller museums and libraries throughout the country. So this is all about just opening people's eyes up um, and getting them excited and knowing that scientists can look like them. And that means they can also be a scientist when they grow up. But you also need to grow with girls as they're growing. So once they're you know, excited about STEM and great, you want to actually get them some hands-on experience and give them the confidence that they can do this. Um, 
So one of the ways that I've done this in the past is running summer camps for high school age girls. Um, so this is an example of a summer camp that I've run um, where in the summer camp itself takes place in either you know MIT or Illinois or a place like this. And in this particular camp, we had students build a 3D printer. Um, and we told them that if the 3D printer looks really good and works really well, then we can go and take these to Kenya where we were doing outreach activities to teach people rapid fabrication tools and say, this 3D printer, we're going to leave there in Kenya. So we told these students, like, if you want this to work and really have an impact, which you can have even at such a young age, you need to build the most robust and reliable 3D printer imaginable. So it set the girls up um, for a real high stakes, real world um, problem, and also gave them a lot of confidence in themselves because then they knew that they had built something that worked and that was going and being in another classroom somewhere else and having a real positive impact. And all many of these girls um, have gone on to become engineers, um, and I'm in touch with them to this day and, and really, really proud of the kinds of things they've accomplished. Um, and of course, access to education is not always access to innovation, right? It's telling you kind of the basic knowledge of what's in the field, but it's not telling you what's the latest in research and how can I get involved. Um, so other ways that I've tried to kind of get that aspect out to a broader audience um, is through books. So I mentioned I still think of myself as a writer, and that's because I have a book um, that's written at a high school level and above, giving people, anyone um, in the world, essentially, whether you're enrolled in a university or you're 70 years old and you just want to know what's happening and new in this idea of interfacing biology with engineering, um, ways of getting people more accessible um, access to this knowledge is, is really, really important to me. And I also try to get folks um, hands-on experience with this as well. So at MIT and a lot of other places around the country, we have these biomaker spaces where you can come in and build the kinds of robots that we make in our labs um, and give people a little bit of a taste um, of the kinds of research that's happening at MIT right now at the cutting edge and have them kind of be inspired and also give us inspiration on new robots that we can design and build. Um, and, the, you know, as we again are advancing past, you know, the undergrad kind of level, you have to think the whole problem I started off by the way I framed our problem is that we have a problem recruiting and promoting women in their careers and retaining them there. Um, so one of the things I really try to do is create a lot of events and conferences where we highlight women um, with STEM degrees, STEM graduate degrees, and show all of the different kinds of careers that are possible um, for them. So, you know, it's not just working in industry or working in academia. You could be the head of the science exhibits at a museum. You could be a writer, you know, you could be all, doing all these things and still be very, very invested in the science world. Um, so I really try to showcase the diversity of potential careers that are possible so that women who are pulled into STEM know that there are many ways um, that they can go and have an impact on the future. Um, and we also try to extend that kind of support throughout academic training. Um, so something that we have at MIT that I created is the Women in Innovation and STEM database at MIT. It's called Wisdom. It's accessible to anyone. Like you can go look it up right now. Um, and anyone, um, all women at MIT are eligible to be in it. And the point is essentially, you know, we have all of these great experts who identify as women who are on our campus. And yet when we're organizing events or seeing who's consulting for the local startups or who's being asked to collaborate, it's predominantly men because it's part of our implicit biases those are the people that we identify and elevate as experts in our career. So for people who want to combat that implicit bias in themselves, we have this resource as a great way to say, oh, you know, I really want the idea, I really want to talk to somebody who has, you know, PhD in microfluidics and knows a lot about liver. And you can type those into our thing and it'll show you like, here's, you know, a world expert in that who happens to be a woman and who happens to be at MIT. Um, so we make that as easy as possible. And we've also run a lot of fellowship programs for the women in our um, database to elevate and support them and, and make sure that they can make their voices and stories heard and be impactful whenever they do talk. Um, so I'd just like to wrap up in the last couple of minutes by talking about, you know, both through my stories and through the experiences that I've had advocating for diversity on campuses, things that you can do um, to make your environment more, more inclusive. Um, so the first thing is to identify an unmet need, right? Just like any scientific problem, you wanna say, this is the thing that's missing, this is the problem, identify what the root cause is. And once you identify that, you need to adapt to the needs of each segment of your market. So you're saying, 
this is the problem. These is, this is the people that it's impacting. Um, what do those people really need? Um, and don't, um, you know, like you talk to them and find out what is the thing that they need and can you provide it? Um, one thing to, to do when you're talking to them though, is to not assume prior knowledge. Um, you know, especially when you're at these really high careers and these really elite institutions, people just assume that you know things, the fact like PhDs are free, but I didn't know that. And sharing that kind of information is social capital that we have, um, that we can share for free um, and can be really, really helpful and impactful to somebody's career. Um, in addition to social capital, Capital, financial capital also matters, right? Many of the things, decisions I made in my life were not because I was passionate about something, um, but because I was looking for career stability, financial stability, visa stability, um, so that my family and I could be provided for. And so when we do things like, oh, if you really care, you would do this unpaid internship, what that's actually doing is selecting for people who come from upper middle class or wealthy families and can choose to make that kind of sacrifice because other people can't because they still need a roof over their head and food to eat, right? So financial capital also matters and can have an impact. And then once you've you know, done all this outreach and talked to people, you, you really wanna identify where you're needed as a leader and where you're needed as an ally. Um, so if somebody, uh, you know, a woman or a person of color or something is already doing something in that space, maybe the best thing you can do um, if they're doing a good job is support them. You don't need to start your own thing. Um, you can just say, all right, like this person's doing great work. Like what is the best way that I can contribute to this mission? But also remember that minorities can't bring up others if we're always, you know, focusing our stuff on outreach and we're not climbing up the ladder ourselves. Um, so there are times where I wish that I wasn't the only one working on women in STEM things and would love um, some from men or people who are more established in their careers who say, okay, maybe I can't be a leader, but as an ally, I can, um, you know, do a lot to advance your efforts or financially support them. And, and that's always very much appreciated. Um, and the final thing is to meet people where they are. I mean, some of the things you've seen, like, to get to some girls, you have to meet them at a statue. To get to other girls, you need to see, give them a trading card or a comic book. Um, you have to meet people where they are. And often that means doing things like braving social media. So when I want to talk to other scientists, women scientists who are at, you know, relatively early stages of their career, I'm mostly on Twitter. But when I want to make sure that I'm um, presented as an engaging scientist that is not scary and that's not some kind of like unapproachable super genius, I do that via Insta stories. Um, so it really means kind of knowing who it is you're trying to reach and, and figuring out where they are and meeting them where they are. However, you don't have to do all of these things. So the final message is to just try something, just try some small positive thing that you can do to make your environment more inclusive um, and know that your um, efforts would be very, very much appreciated by people like me who didn't start off with a ton of resources, but now occupy positions of great privilege um, because of the, the luck and the opportunities that we were afforded. Um, so with that, I think I wrapped up with two minutes to spare. So. Just wanna open up the floor for any kind of discussion or conversations you have. Um, hopefully you have them now and happy to chat. And if not now, again, I'm, I'm fairly accessible online. So my Twitter handle is Dr. Ratu Raman, which is on um, the screen. Um, and I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn and all the other, all the other things. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I, was, I feel like we should all have a round of applause as well. I really enjoyed that. And I've had a couple of my friends who I know are watching the other side message me saying, I can't take my eyes off this. So that's amazing. Thank you very much, Ritu. We've had a few questions come through already, so I'll go through those. But just to everyone watching, please remember now is your opportunity. If you want to ask a question, um, ask it within the next five minutes so we can make sure we get that over to Ritu. Uh, so Ritu, the first one we have here um, is that it's fascinating that due to having um, your mother being so supportive and herself being into engineering, um, it seems that initially you weren't put off by the lack of diversity because I guess it just wasn't as apparent. So this seemed to come later for you when you went to university. Did that shake your confidence in any way or had your kind of upbringing embedded this belief and, and kept you on your path forward? Yeah, yeah, this is um, a great question. I'm so glad you brought it up because that's the thing, right? I grew up in such an insular bubble that in my home, not only was I, it was very obvious that my mom was a great um, engineer and technical thinker, but also that my dad and my grandpa implicitly and explicitly 
um, expressed respect for her in that domain. So I had this great example of a woman leader and male allies in my life. And I thought this is how the world is, right? So I lived in this bubble and I was very happy. And I think it's so important that at such an early vulnerable stage of my life, um, that was never an issue. And yet, even though I came from a place of such strength, when I was the only one, um, it was incredibly challenging. So you have to imagine that if somebody else didn't have the parents that I had, how much harder it is for them to stay and to persevere. I do think that one thing that helped me again, and this is the luck of my upbringing, is that because I was moving around so much, it was not my first experience being the only in a room. I might not have always been the only woman in a room, but I was often the only you know, person of color in a room, for example, when I my family moved to Iowa. Um, and so you learn how to adapt to your environment, how to communicate with different kinds of people and how to, I would say, integrate into a society without losing your sense of self and erasing everything that makes you, you an individual. Um, and that, I think, definitely helped me. Um, when I was kind of integrating into engineering society as a woman. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's so important what you're saying about keeping your sense of self as well, because I think when when you're kind of othered or you're the only one in the room, as you say, it can be um, kind of you feel like, oh, I should change. I'll be like all these other people, like a chameleon. But I think that's really important. It's what you bring to the table is different. And that's what makes it important. So, yeah, thank you very much for that. Excellent. Um, the next question we have is, can you talk about the importance of mentors, mentors, sorry, especially for women? Oh, I think we might have lost Ritu. Yeah, it looks like Ritu is frozen, unfortunately. Um, I'll give a few minutes to see if we can get her back. Um, in the meantime, let me give you a, a quick plug. Um, so the next one, if you've enjoyed this uh, lecture, is on the 31st March, where we have Ellen Roche speaking about augmenting dynamic organic function uh, with device-based approaches. And again, don't, don't let the titles of these talks put you off, because I think, as you've seen today, the way the information has, is presented is so accessible um, and so engaging that it's relevant to anyone. Um, and in particular, the focus is on diversity and on trying to get more women into um, business and careers. So if, if that's something for you, we do encourage you to join us on the 31st of March. Oh, well, I just got a text from Ritu saying she's trying to rejoin, so we'll give her a few more minutes. Um, just in case she does rejoin, please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, as you see, she's more than happy to answer them. Um, we've got I think one more to go. So if you want to add a third question, there's plenty of time. So pop that in the chat and I can read that out if we get her back online. But there might be something that's happened if you can't get back on. Let me see. Oh, she's having some internet connection issues, unfortunately. We'll give her a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, the, the seminar I was mentioning with Ellen Roche, that one you can get to the same way as you found this one. Uh, use the link. Um, that you use and it will take you to that Business Wales page where you can see all the upcoming webinars. So we do encourage you to watch that one as well. You can have it on in the background whilst you're doing work and, and learn something new as you go about. Hi, Ritu. Hi, sorry. I don't know why. I think I might use internet. <laughs> We've got uh, another question for you then, if that's okay, um, which is asking you about um, the importance of mentors and how important you think they are, especially for women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I certainly talked about the mentorship inside the house, but let me talk a little bit more about the mentorship I've had outside the house, um, because this is another example of where luck has had, I would say, an outsized impact um, on my success. And I say that not to detract from, you know, my hard work or something, but to point out that there are so many factors that are outside of our control um, that contribute to me being a successful woman in science. And I can very easily see where other people did not have that luck, they would have stopped even if they were just as hardworking or as talented. So the place where I would say, you know, the mentors that I've had, um, both my PhD mentor, Professor Rashid Bashir, who's the Dean of Engineering at Illinois, and my postdoc mentor, uh, Professor Bob Langer here at MIT, are men who are very senior in their career, um, who genuinely had no bias <laughs> towards me as a woman who is in their lab. And that is surprisingly rare. Um, they not, they think of me when somebody asks them to nominate somebody for an award, they think of me and they nominate me for that award in their letters. They write words that are very strongly worded and about how I'm such a great leader and scientific 
all those things matter. Um, and if they were not kind, um, successful people who very much valued me as a scientist and did not treat me differently because I was a woman, then I would not be where I am in my career because that's how academia works. It's very hierarchical. So the role of a mentor can have a tremendous, tremendous impact. And again, I'd like to highlight here, there are things you can do to explicitly be a good person. And there's a lot of things that you can implicitly do that you're not realizing that might have an impact on women. So really reflect on the women who you manage and say like, am I giving them more of the caretaker type role where they're always taking the notes and meetings or always the ones cleaning up the lab? Um, why am I doing that? And is it because I have this idea in my head of, of women as the helpers in society whose natural role it is to do that? Something else I've noticed because now I'm a professor, I read a lot of recommendation letters that people write for other grad students and postdocs. And you'll be amazed at the number of times. I mean, it's, it's, it's blindingly obvious when you're going into this and reading it, you see a rec letter for a man will be like, he's a leader, he's a technical expert. What a guy, like love that guy. Um, you read rec letters for women, and even if they say somebody's a good scientist, they're like, you know, she's always just like so sweet, polite, well-dressed, really gets along well with others, um, relies on her woman's intuition. That's something I saw this past weekend. Like, you know, she has the logic of somebody who has a science career, but she also relies on her woman's intuition a lot and all these like really, really dumb stereotypes. And so when somebody is reading it and they're not thinking about this, what are the words that are coming out at them? One person is a leader and a genius and the other person, well, she's nice. Right. And like, who are you going to hire? I mean, you probably want to hire the expert because you're hiring for a scientific role. And so doing things like this of really going through your letters and how you talk about people and how you lead people and saying, am I really highlighting this woman as a technical expert and really, truly treating her as an equal? Um, and I think you'll find that a lot of us don't, even people like me who think of it often, fall into these traps. Um, so it's something that we need to constantly remind ourselves of. Amazing. Thanks, Ritu. Yeah, I think that um, came up in a group we had. So we, we have a group here at MSPAC that we run occasionally where the women um, of the companies here meet up once a month. So we call it time of the month because we thought it was funny. Um, but we discuss <laughs> things that affect us in the workplace. And, and that was one of the things that came up. A few people kept saying, I'm always asked to make the tea and I don't understand why, because I miss mm -hmm. part of the meeting to go and do that. So I think that that is universal, I think. And it's good to hear that other people are facing that issues and it's not particular to a company, we can all help to kind of discourage that and to, to call it out. And one of the things um, we came up with to challenge that actually was to um, ask why. So rather than, because I think as women sometimes, whether you're in a place, we find it difficult to challenge these norms and to say, I don't want to, why should yeah. I make the tea? Um, so we just came yeah. up with ask why. So if they said, oh, Emily, can you make the tea? Okay, why me? Are we doing a, a rotor system? And it just challenges, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, why did I ask Emily? I guess because she's the woman and then you don't want to admit that to yourself so you'll yeah. you kind of go around it so that was one of the things we, really we found helpful because i'm not the most aggressive person and i feel like a level of like passive assertion that i can i can do <laughs> i'll give it a try yes <laughs> Awesome. Um, so we've got a few more questions. Another one actually about your mother. Um, so what issues did she face that might have been different to you as a woman in STEM? Um, and did she, is there sort of one gem or piece of advice that she offered you that, that you still go back to the, to this day? Yeah, yeah. This is another great question that actually I don't get asked often enough um, because I'm actually, so I'm actually the third generation of a woman with a science college degree in my family. So my mom's mom has a degree in botany, um, had a degree in botany. My mom was a chemical engineer um, and I'm a mechanical engineer. So three generations, like very rare. Um, however, what challenges did they face? The challenges they face is that they were not encouraged to continue their <laughs> careers, right? So my mom, for example, did work when I was very young, but partly because we moved and partly because there was a huge societal expectation that many of us face, even to this day, to think that if you're working all the time, then you are not being a good mother to your child. Um, she worked working, I was around um, 10, and uh, you know, didn't really, and also even, you know, she really wanted to do research and do a PhD um, and when she was in her mid twenties and was very encouraged that at the time, like it's better to focus on getting married and like, this is not really something that you can do right now. And and she's also you know, an assertive person, but there's only so much you can do to push up against pressure from everybody around you telling you something different. Um, so she, I think, um, you know, 
was a chemical engineer, practicing chemical engineer, but I sat on a lot of things that she wanted to do. I think, I will say, I think that um, being a full-time mother is a perfectly good and useful way to spend your life. It's something that I would consider, and I think it's totally fine for people to do it. I just think it has to be a choice. Um, so, and that's not a choice that was given and it's not a choice that was given to a lot of people in the past. Um, and it's also not the sort of thing where somebody might choose to be a full-time mom when their kid is younger and then we prevent their re-entry into the workforce when maybe they have a little bit more flexibility into their life. Um, so there's all these sorts of things and barriers that she faced um, that I have not faced so much, but you know, she wanted to get a PhD and she couldn't, and I did. Um, and I don't know um, what kinds of pressures I will face when, you know, I don't have a child now, but if I ever have a family, I don't know what kinds of pressures I'll face to either readjust my calendar or even take some time to be a full-time parent. Um, will I be able to do that? Will I feel sad for not doing that? I don't know. Um, so I might face similar challenges as well, but I do feel like there's more support um, now for managing that. Um, there could be even more. Um, but it's it's something I think about a lot, actually, because she's a lot smarter than me. And I think it's a real pity. Oh, thank you for sharing that with us, Ruth, too. Um, the next question is kind of linked to that as well. So someone has said, for many, trying to follow an academic path um, can come with the expectation that you can move around doing several postdoc look positions in different locations. Um, and this can obviously be difficult if there's a need for someone to be based in one location, for example, if you have family commitments. Um, and it's difficult to overcome in these instances and may reduce opportunities, um, particularly for women to progress to professor level labs. Do you find women make more sacrifices to be able to reach your level? What's your perception of that? Absolutely, absolutely. So much so that yesterday when I heard a story of a woman who got a really prestigious faculty position and her husband left his faculty position that was less prestigious but still really good um, to come be a research scientist instead at the place where she got a faculty role, I was so shocked because I have never heard of a man doing that. Um, and I know a lot of couples in science, right? So I was like, wow, as a first time in 10 years that I've heard of the man making the sacrifice. So yes, I think it is very rare. I am so impressed, happy that that happened. I would love if that happened more often, because here's the thing. I, I think it's not that, you know, it should always be the woman. It should always be the man. It's that, that relationships and partnerships are all supposed to be about give and take. And especially in these heteronormative um, heterosexual couples, um, the implication is always that the sacrifice should be the woman. And certainly that's been my experience in the past. Um, and it's been very tough. So when I, I mentioned that my job search during the pandemic was very, very difficult. And part of it was because I was trying to decide, um, you know, what role my personal life should play in that professional life decision making process. And I got some, there was a time when I had no other you know, I didn't have a job offer from MIT. I didn't have job offers from cities. I was getting job offers pulled. And I had one excellent job offer that was at a top institution that just happened to be in a smaller town. And at that time, I was like, well, if I want to get married and have children someday, I just don't see that happening in a town of this size. Mm -hmm. And I had to turn that job down without any other options um, because I just knew that I would be unhappy, but I knew a ton of people who would have taken that job because it's a top 10 institution. I know a ton of people who have done that and who have decided to be professors and have had to sacrifice that other aspect of their life because they're like, you just can't have both things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. I think there are many cases where you actually cannot have all of the things. You cannot be at a top institution and be a, have a great relationship and have children. And to tell people that lie is just making them feel like failures when really mm -hmm. the system is, is the one that's failing them. Um, so, you know, I think all I can say, I, I don't have like a solution necessarily, but I will say that if you feel like you are not able to check off all those boxes, it is not just you. Um, and I do often see that the sacrifices are made more by women. Um, and I think we each have to just go with our guts on this, right? I think if you do feel like you want to make a sacrifice for a relationship, which I totally get, I think that's fine. I think the only thing you have to tell yourself is like, is this going to be the rest of my life? And is there going to be another time in my career where maybe I don't make the sacrifice and the other person does? And if that person is the sort of person that would, then great, you should probably stick with them because that's rare. <laughs> um, and I think you also shouldn't make yourself see for losing a professional 
being healthy to make yourself happy because as human beings, we're all, you know, sort of a mess and, and that should be, um, it's okay to prioritize that. Amazing. Well, thank you, Isu. That was a really good answer. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think we've got one last question then, which is, um, have you yourself ever, ever suffered from imposter syndrome? And, and if you did, or if you still do, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, I feel like when I started, I almost didn't. And you would think that now that I am at the top of my field and in a leadership role and in privilege, now why would you? Um, but it's happening more now than it did before. And I think partially it's because the more and more removed I get against from the safety bubble of my family where everything was encouraged and accepted, um, it kind of wears down at you over time. And again, I think there's a difference between one of a few women in a room and being like, the highest ranking woman in a room all the time. It is an incredible amount of pressure for somebody who is in their first year of a career post the training role um, to always be the only representative of somebody like this and saying something and you're constantly overthinking everything. And especially for me, you know, the two year job hunt really wore down any kind of self esteem and self confidence I had in myself. And even though I got the top job in my field that was also my top choice, I, a lot of people have said to my face that I only got it because I'm a woman. Um, and even though I, I know that's logically not possible because why would MIT invest so many resources and money and things in somebody they, they thought would be a total failure? I know that logically, but if you already are coming from a place of low self-esteem, you're worn out and then people say this to you, you do start questioning yourself in those moments of weakness, right? And you seek those external validation, like, oh, maybe if I just get that grant or just get that paper or win that award, it'll solve this and I'll feel better. Um, but that's not how that works. <laughs> you never feel better. Um, so I do experience it. I think the only way to really get through it is I find it helps to look at other women. So when I see something going badly for me, I blame myself. And when I look at something happening to another woman, I'm like, well, she clearly is at you know at the top of her game she did everything right she gave a great interview and then she got an unfair outcome and i can totally see that it was unfair when it's her and that it's not her fault when it's her and so that helps me kind of feed back to then it's probably not you too um so that's a way that i deal with it um but i guess there are other tactics as well <laughs> that's good that's excellent i'm still trying to build up my own armory of tactics i think to get over the imposter syndrome so that's really good advice i'll add to that thank you very much Amazing. I think that's all we have time for and all the questions that we've had for today. So um, firstly, thank you very much to our audience for being so participating today. I've had some silent audiences in the past. There's nothing worse. It's great to see you've been listening, you've been engaging, and hopefully you've got as much as I feel I have today out of this webinar. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the Welsh Government for choosing us to be part of this uh, series of webinars for the month of March. It's been fantastic to be involved. and. Thank you, a huge thank you, Ritu, to you for coming along and giving your time today and, and for being so open as well and answering those questions really honestly. And I think that's that's helped myself certainly, but I'm sure a lot of people watching today have definitely got a lot out of that experience as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Amazing. And hope you all have a good day.